Welcome everyone to the 2023 Global Animal Disaster Management Conference brought to you in partnership with Animal Evac New Zealand and our platinum sponsor Four Paws International. Before we begin, we have just a few basic housekeeping items. There was an error with the Australian Times for the New York sessions, H being the remaining one, on the initial schedule. Please visit our website at www.gadmc.org to view the updated and corrected schedule. The Zoom chat feature has been disabled, so if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. This year, we have enabled multilingual closed captioning, so if you would like to hear the presentation in another language, please click on the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen. We encourage you to use the hashtag GADMCONF in your social media post to help spread awareness about our conference. A short evaluation will be made available as you exit this presentation. Your feedback is valuable to us and will help to shape the next GAPMAC conference. Finally, a reminder that the video recording of this and all other presentations will be available later this year once they have been properly edited. It is our privilege to welcome Victor McPherson. He brings 30 years of fire service experience to his role as lead instructor for livestock emergency response programs with Food and Farm Care in Ontario and the University of Guelph, also in Canada. He is presenting on the best practices in livestock emergency response. Welcome, Victor. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. So the, the Livestock Emergency Response Program, this is a uh, course that we've taught throughout Canada and the United States. Uh, we started this in, in uh, spring of 2017 and we're presently still uh, teaching the same program but has evolved over the years. We've taught over 900 first responders uh, th uh, throughout this program. They have a website. Uh, it can go on anytime. It's free for everybody to use, and this is about the best practice. Uh, they have our workshops that are available through farm uh, and uh, farming, farm fires, all that other stuff. And we have videos that uh, will uh, show how to do these incidents if they occur. So what you want to look for and how you want to do that. And they've all different rays of vehicles and some of them are dated, but they're excellent videos to show how to first responders to do what they have to do on the scenes. So emergency resource fact sheets. Uh, there's, we've got five different ones. Uh, a preventive uh, accident prevention, barn fires involving farm animals, dealing with uh, the aftermath of a barn fire, what to do in a motor vehicle accident involving farm animals, and the latest one we just updated is farm animals on the loose. And, and a recent event that caused uh, us to update that for first responders to have a chart sheet to follow. This is the updated uh, list and they wanted more information and facts in regards to the animals and what they're handling and safety precautions. So we've included all those in this uh, little short list that can be found on the website. So farm animals are loose on the loose. Uh, for that incident. Sometimes farm animals just get out of the barn or the pasture and you wanna evaluate the situation itself. What type of animals do I have? How many animals I have? Where are the animals? Are they beside the road, on the road? Is it a major road or a minor road? What are the risks that are in, at that point? Uh, assess the risks and the scale of response. What are your resources on the scene? Can we herd them slowly back into the pasture or other containment area or do I need more help? So you ask yourself the question, what's my resources? Who am I gonna call? Police, fire, uh, municipal animal control, local farmers, and local farmers that have trailers. So we have this breakdown sheet here that uh, emergency services are using. And as it breaks down is that you evaluate the situation with a flow chart. Do I, how many are out there? Do, what do I need? Assess the risk and the scale of response. Who do I have to call? And who am I going to call for my resources? So this could be unreported or reported. 
So if it's unreported, it's handled very locally, very close to where the scene is, and it doesn't require anything outside that resources that are there. And reported is I have an issue and I have to uh, respond for emergency services, so I have to deal with the issue. So it, it can happen anywhere. This right here is in Alberta. Uh, approximately two, uh, 20 ostriches escaped from their enclosure. So the police uh, responded to this with uh, the farmer and not knowing how to contain animals. So they used vehicles which and lights and sirens to allow them to, to slow down or stop, which is all the wrong things to do. And you can see in this video here, the, the farmer's in the vehicle, tries to grab the ostrich. The ostrich is much stronger and gets up and runs away. Uh, then the policing using this to uh, use their vehicles and block it. And then in the end, the ostrich did have to be euthanized. So some of the programs in the program, what we're doing is we're teaching handling techniques for first responders. So we want to minimize this, the risk to them. So we tell them to minimize the predator in themselves. And no rapid movements, move slowly and methodical, avoid direct eye contact, stay in the line of sight, do not shout or yell, do not chase. Remember, slow is fast. We ensure that they all understand that. You want to maintain on the picture on the top left that you want to maintain a safe herd area. Allow them to calm down and, and uh, drop their heads and feed. You want to always have an escape route from the bottom left-hand picture. So you don't want to be charged or cornered. Uh, the top right hand picture there you can see the incident there that they've got the livestock in an underpass well lit so there's no shadows uh, they're uh, herding the animals into a corralled area but some of the problems that we have and at night with livestock is all emergency services have a high reflective vest and when you have emergency lights on scene that can induce a flight or fight mode in regards to the secondary flash that you can see on the bottom right hand corner of the uh, of that, that picture there of the emergency lights. So you want to shut off your emergency lights in the hot zone and illuminate the ground so it doesn't create any shadows to allow the livestock to calm down. And the other factor we have here in Canada is extremes. We have weather conditions. In the summertime, we could be 40 Celsius plus with high humidity. So the picture on the top left, you've got a livestock trail that's turned over and on a very hot summer day. So for best practice, you want to cool that livestock because that right there is somebody's livelihood. And then we want to uh, demonstrate best practice. Top center picture areas, you have a poultry trailer that is flipped over on a major highway. So you want to allow the people to get through there, so a single lane, but at the same time, be prepared with an emergency response trailer to get that poultry out and then reassembled onto another trailer. Or on the top right hand corner that these uh, folks there, they're stopped there for five hours in a contained area with the livestock trailer that had an accident and it was very uh, at a high temperature and high humidity. Uh, the bottom left hand corner right there is a livestock trailer in northern Ontario. You've got sub-zero conditions with wind chill that's occurring. These are two livestock trailers that uh, slipped on um, poor road conditions. Uh, in the far right side, you've got a catastrophic uh, accident there with multiple, multiple cars. And I think in total, I, there is five livestock trailers that are involved in this accident. So you've got so much emergency services are going to be overwhelmed very quickly. And in the, the, very, the small picture in the middle is uh, in the Alberta response teams. They've got it down to a science how to best practice uh, their livestock that's being transported throughout the uh, province. They have 19 trailers established all throughout the province. So some of the things that we teach in this program too is trailer constructions and unibody design. The most common response is, I did not know the trailer was designed like this. I did not know how the floors were, or how everything was made. So the trailers are designed in two, in two parts. One, they're either riveted or welded. And they're both, all the universe, uh, trailers that are for livestock transport are all a unibody design. So it needs all its parts to make it strong. That has uh, ventilation holes, uh, either rectangular or round, and it does pose a possible leg entrapment if the trailer rolls on its side. Uh, most, a lot of trailers out there have multi-floor compartmentalization configurations that it can be lifted up, lowered down for all the different sides of the livestock. The picture on the bottom right-hand corner you see that this trailer here has all its cold weather panels on it, but is delivering uh, product out west. 
So it would be loaded with a forklift, which is a trailer is designed stronger. And that floor recedes into the bay to the bottom of the trailer to allow the forklift to get to where it, to load the product. Once it gets to the area, it offloads the product, goes to the farm, puts its floors into place, and then now it's got a, a three-layer or a two-layer floor system. The, track, the picture on the right is a straight truck with a manual install floor, and that was designed to haul uh, pork only. And then here's some trailers designs that we go through in the PowerPoint presentation. There is so many different configurations. So the very top one is a standard livestock trailer. You've got all the different compartments uh, and they just change to the, whatever the design or the product that they are hauling with livestock. On the right side, clockwise, you've got a, a livestock trailer there that has a, a living quarters in the front and it has a storage in the rear that can, have, can haul up to 10 horses, um, size, there's different sizes of beef or pork. Uh, the bottom right hand corner this is a poultry trailer and this poultry trailer is, is designed for cold weather uh, has and warm weather so it has a ventilation has fans it's a modular design it's loaded with forklifts the bottom left hand corner is a um, uh, you got the different style trailers for equine for horses uh, the very first one there is a standard stock trailer that can be used for all different uh, of livestock. So just because it's there doesn't mean it's whole as haul as being hauling a uh, pork or beef. Now it can be an equine. So it could be a two stall, four stall haul. The trailer in the middle is a um, a little nicer. It has a living quarters, smaller kitchen area, an awning, air conditioning, and it could be a two stall straight or a three stall uh, slant load. It all depends on how the configuration is set up. On the far left side of the trailer in that bottom left-hand picture, it has uh, multiple uh, trailers. So it could be a two, four, six, and possibly up to eight uh, horses that can be towed into this in, or stored into this trailer with a, uh, on top is a cart uh, storage there. So when they're on the track, they have that ability to do that. And some polo teams will use stuff like that. Uh, the picture on the far left top corner, you have a standard stock trailer that is either a module or a divided or open area and it can call and it can transport many different species and that's usually farm to farm or farm to processing with a small amount of numbers in the middle we have a, a pork trailer this is for uh, smaller for weans and feeders that are being transported from farm to farm or or the larger ones that uh, for finishing hogs it comes with a ventilation system for each compartment area it has uh, fans that are built into it, and it even has a watering feed station that are built into that for the for that livestock. And in the center is the most generalized used trailer system, which is just a standard pickup truck with a stock trailer. That is the one that's mostly wide, widely used between uh, farm to farm or farm to processing. And this right here is the trailers that and for cold weather paneling. Top left-hand corner is a poultry trailer. Top right hand corner is a stock stock trailer with its paneling and the bottom one is a standard li uh, some livestock liner that could have multiple panels it can have less panels more panels and this can be hauling pork or beef uh, sheep anything that it needs to be transported with this trailer so some of the other things we talk about in the the program is all about the integrity how it can be compromised these trailers are made out of aluminum so it doesn't take a lot to tear apart uh, the, the vehicle. And we remind them that this is a unibody design. And then once you take parts away or damage certain areas, it becomes unstable. The picture on the far left is a catastrophic. So you've got the, the floors and uh, a side that has been removed. So you're gonna have a high um, uh, death rate amongst the livestock. The picture in the middle, it's not common, but it does happen is brake fires. So you can have that fire on board and then it's going to be either into the rear area, the back area, or the front area. And we'll talk about that a little later in another incident. Uh, then on the picture on the far right side, you have a the livestock trailer that did roll on the left side, but not knowing that the entire left side was compromised on its supports and uh, connections and riveting area. So if they had to do anything, they would cause issues. So they have to reevaluate on their extrication. 
some of the equipment we talk about what's the best one to do, but bare minimum is the PFD, two uh, uh, slings, uh, some emergency halters. It's highly recommended. You can do a lot of the extrications with uh, the type of drags on a farm and certain trailers. Uh, the best cutting tool out there is a sawzall. It can do a lot of work. It's very easy uh, to do that. I just have to remember on some cutting safety tips is you don't want to create too, you don't want to go too deep. You want to keep that blade at a minimum and you want to keep the blade cool and you want to have edge protection as much as possible for first responder and the livestock. So we'll just cover a little bit of the trailers. These are some of the sizes and throughout the world, the trailer sizes are different, but in Canada, this is pretty well general here. The trailer weight size of the truck itself is 9,000 kg. The, the truck and trailer or the trailer empty is 9,000 kg. Trailer loaded is about 27,300 kg. And then the combined weight is 45,300 kg. So that will equate to how much, how much animals are on board. So for beef, you can have 100 to 150 animals, which weigh in between 180 to 275 ki kilograms. Or you can change the size and go from 30 to 66 animals at 409 to 620 kilograms. And then you get into the larger Alberta beef that are coming into Ontario for processing. They're uh, 20 to 25 animals, which equate to 740 to 925 kilograms. Very large animal, and they are not exposed to humans very much. So. They, if you have an incident, it can be a lot of problems with them. In the hog industry, we have weans, approximately uh, 2,000 at four kilograms each. Feeders, you got about 500 at 32 kilograms. And finishing hogs, you got about 175 at 114 kilograms each. Then you have poultry. Uh, and these numbers are uh, all over the place for the different style trucks. Uh, so just a general number for uh, turkey. Yeah, you're, you're looking at 725 at about 7.4 kilograms plus. And then for uh, the rest of the poultry chicken, you're looking at 3,000 to 10,000 chicks at two kilograms plus. So the approximate livestock that are being transported per day in Ontario, and this is throughout Ontario. Uh, so poultry, which includes uh, turkey, boiler, chicks, and end of uh, lay fowl, that's approximately 200 million. And that equates to 192 livestock trailers on the road per day. And then you got hogs, hog, the hog industry, which is uh, the weans, feeders, and finishing hogs. It's about 480,000. That's 100 uh, livestock trucks per day. For beef, cattle that are being moved throughout Ontario, that's 650,000. That equates to 63 livestock trailers per day. And then what's being transported to the United States from Canada, you're looking at 110,000 at 12 livestock trailers per day. So when you add all this up, so each day on the road, you have 367 trailers on the road, all right? In a week, you've got 1,835 livestock trailers on the road per day. In one year, you got 95,450 livestock trailers per day on the road. And this doesn't include uh, the equine, which is summer months, you could have four to 5,000 trailers a day. And then farm to farm processing is totally unknown. But the amount of livestock that can be transported on our highways are covering approximately 169,000 kilometers throughout the province. That's on the roads that are being used to transport livestock. So we're going to walk around the trailer. And some of the aspects we do is about safety for folks uh, when they show up for a scene. So the trailer itself is rolled over on its side. You want to look at the structure. Since it's a unibody design, you're looking at the trailer to make sure it's uniform. Do I have any holes? Do I have livestock at large? What do I need for my resources? Do I have any bending? Do I have a, 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 a the roof that's collapsed? Do I have any livestock that's impaled by the, the uh, uh, by any of the equipment and stuff that's being used? What is the rear of the trailer? What configuration is it a roll up door? Is it a barn door? So that will tell you what how strong this trailer is. As you walk around, you're going to be looking at the, the axles, the subframe to make sure the unibody design is still intact. So when you do your extrication, there's nothing that's coming apart and everything is strong. So in Ontario and Canada, we uh, use the incident management system for a livestock emergency. IMS is the most standardized approach to emergency management encompassing personnel, which has the facilities and equipment and procedures and communications operating with a common goal and structure. When an incident occurs, IMS is the best approach. So 
So you want to include your response, your incident size up, your scene safety factors, and your needs implementing your response plan. So response time factors, this all occur, it takes time for this. So incident occurs, time of day, weather conditions. The 911 call, cell reception, or landline, or in location to the correct uh, dispatch, appropriate uh, resources. Responding, crews, availability, distance. Si uh, scene size up, life safety, scene safety. Uh, resources, on your response, train personnel, containment, stock trailers, heavy tow and cleanup. Your pre-action plan is, need, is part of your needs and all about training. IMS is your is uh, the response for to implement your plan. So when an incident occurs, this is how the plan will come into effect. So the driver of the livestock caller or bystander will call 911, a size up of the callers, which is your location, and the animals that are at large or possible emergency contact list that's available. The 911 dispatcher dispatches appropriate emergency services, police, fire, and ambulance. And then action takes, takes place on your plan. Starts with the drivers and the dispatch to deal with the livestock. The first responders on scene complete initial size up, communi communicating back with each other through their dispatch and livestock at large. So that would in increase their safety zone and their hot zones. First responders communicate a good sense, uh, scene description to the dispatch for requiring any additional needs, which would include resources for life safety and containment. Number one priority is life safety is mitigated for protection. Number two is scene safety is mitigated for protection for the livestock uh, versus uh, people in vehicles or people at large that are willing to help. The incident command decision making is based on training with experts in their fields. And remember, plan. This takes time to implement it. What is the elements of plan itself? Plan is the protection, our bystanders, first responder, and the animals, the location of the animals and containment or at large. The animal, what type of animal do I have and safety considerations? And my needs is the temporary containment, containment transfer, and dealing with injured or dead stock. So protection. So on the top right uh, left-hand corner, the question I said earlier about if you have a brake fire, the, the driver had a split second decision. So he decided to release the, uh, the livestock from the trailer. All the livestock that exited the trailer uh, moved down the, the highway. And this is a very narrow road in Northern Ontario. So it has a high traffic area. Uh, eventually they had to be uh, hunted down and euthanized because they were having a lot of car and motor vehicle collisions with the livestock that was at large that could not be uh, contained. All the livestock that was on that trailer it was survived and it was continued on with its, uh, uh, to its destination. Uh, bottom left hand corner is the middle of the summer and then as I said earlier it's best practice so you're going to help that livestock and reduce uh, their heat temperature and cool them off. On the far right side, you can see this is a hog trailer that flipped over and they're all contained. So you have to set up for extrication of the livestock and then uh, stop the roads and everything for your recovery. So it's protecting the first responders from the traffic. In the very middle there, you can see on May, 2022, this was a, a rollover in Northern Ontario and it, the livestock was at large. It was uh, almost three quarters of the load. They ended up getting most of the load, but the rest of the load was at large in the woods. So in the summer of 2022, you can see the livestock that's foraging on the side of the road. They were corralled and taken and uh, brought back. And then in September 2022, in the bottom middle, we have another cattle that's uh, out in the road. It's just right, right next to where the accident is. And then they had, they've had multiple uh, car accidents with the livestock. So they bring people in to see if they can hunt them and uh, prevent this. And then December of 2022, this is a picture of another one that was at large. So it poses a real problem with uh, motor vehicle collision if all the animals aren't contained properly. So L is your location of the animals in containment or at large. Uh, the picture on the far left, this is a uh, wean truck that rolled over and the livestock is exiting on a manure chute. So they're, they're very small, they're agile, and they can get out of it very easily. So the picture in the center, you've got the two, the top and bottom, 
Uh, they're at large on the side of the road and just groups of them all over the place. There's approximately 1,500 and about 900 had uh, exited the vehicle. And then that poses a problem with uh, traffic. It was a low traffic area, which was, was, was great. And then they could contain it and then uh, re, uh, reload them and have them continue on with their destination. Animals. What type of animals and safety consideration? If I have the picture on the right, hogs, it's very easy. They're not overly active. You can contain them very, very well. The picture on the left, uh, this incident was an unfortunate one in regards to uh, the reason why our um, response uh, sheet that was developed for animals at large was updated was because of this incident. Uh, 30 horses got out in a built up area, which is a city of approximately 150,000 people outside. And they got in, there was a single vehicle rollover that ended up being a fatality. So these horses are walking down the streets of this one city. And then your needs, all right? The needs itself is all what takes time, is temporary containment. I have them on the truck, they're not going anywhere. There's no uh, uh, immediate danger to them. So set up a transfer containment. Second picture there, you can see how they got all their penning. They've got everything, they're bringing it up to the road because you have to load the livestock at the road on the stock trailers. And then you have to deal with injured livestock. What do I have injured? Do I evaluate them? Are they gonna be evaluated or possibly euthanized? And then the picture on the far bottom right hand side, then you have, once they've been extricated to the live stock, now you have the dead stock that you have to deal with. And then you have to bring in your machinery and then actually flip the trailer back over and then deal with the mess. So one of those things is the trailers itself, when it's upright, it, we fall under the rules of the CFIA in regards to how many trail, how many, how much livestock can be put on that trailer and how much livestock, how much space does it need around it? So if that's a hunt, that's a, a 52 square, a 50, um, 50 foot trailer, that's seven and a half feet wide. So it works out to approximately 390 square feet. But if that trailer rolls over on its side, that changes. So it goes from three, it goes to three feet by 52 feet, and then you have 156 square feet. That are only three, there's only three feet of standing room. There's not a lot of room. And it depends on the construction of the trailer will determine how much uh, problems you'll have on the inside. So this trailer here has, is a trailer that can uh, deliver uh, a product out west, but at the same time, and when it returns, it's bringing uh, beef back. So you have a one piece floor that is uh, covers a, approximately a 30 feet inside that trailer that's seven and a half feet wide. It'll become dislodged. So at one end of the trailer, as you can see in the bottom, you only have a two foot uh, span on the side. And remember the trailer is seven and a half feet wide. So all those, that livestock is all piled onto each other. And then whatever's underneath that floor, you still have to get out on the other side. So it poses a huge problem. So on all the animals, right, in the small space, this, this right here gives you an excellent example. Top left-hand corner, this is the trailer itself. It, it had an accident uh, off half off a cliff, so it had to be shored up, it had to bring in equipment. So then they could bring in the stock trailers. The picture of the first long, thin one there, you can see uh, this is a wean truck. It was, had approximately 2,000 weans on board. So they had to unload the viable livestock. So the picture in the middle there, you can see they cut a hole through each floor to get to the area where the livestock is. And then you see the bottom picture there, uh, the livestock that has the dead stock in it and that one picture. Then you see the gentleman with the hard hat. They are unloading one or two weans each and every time through this hole and then placing them in a trailer. And then the trailer is transported down to a stock uh, 53 foot, a 52 foot trailer that's going to transport them. This takes time. That was 17 hours to unload and clean up. So you want to bring the plan together, your protection, your location, your animals, your needs. So all of this comes in, you extricate, you have your handlers, you have your penning, you have your stock trailers, you have feed, you have emergency services, and they're all trained. These are the incidents that we've been recording that there's a lot more out there, the, but these are the big ones that I've had in my PowerPoint and we review most of these things in regards to the livestock. It's all throughout Ontario, mainly in Northern Ontario. So 
Farm and Food Care have come up with an emergency resource uh, response sheet for the regular truck routes. Uh, we encourage uh, all the uh, first responders in that area, which is police, fire, uh, to get a hold of their uh, local area, their, their stock panels, uh, gooseneck trailers, uh, veterinarians, uh, paramount veterinarians, if they can get them. All right, a uh, possibility for removing dead stock, uh, their stockyards, processing plant, and have the, the trucker actually come into the emergency services and meet with each other so they understand their emergency response program. Uh, Equine Guelph uh, does a resources uh, for an awareness and operational training for hands-on, for best practice, for uh, livestock. Uh, since that program has started in 2013, we've uh, reached over 480 people that have been trained in that area. You can get a hold of uh, Susan in regards to any of that. All their videos, everything to do with uh, the livestock emergency response is all online and it's free to peruse through and yeah, keep it as a link. And if you ever forget how to do it, it's there for you to learn how to do it. I wanna thank everybody for this evening and allow me the opportunity to, to come here and show you what we've been doing for the last few years for emergency livestock rollover. There's my uh, address and contact point. I feel free to give us a call anytime. Thank you. Victor, what an amazing presentation. I was going to say, please leave your contact information up there. Um, we do have two very quick, well, hopefully very quick questions. Mm -hmm. The first is with multi-floor compartments, is it possible for legs to get down between the floor edge and the side of the trailer? Uh, in response to that, if, we're, if it's upright and it's traveling, no, it's not. It's uh, there's uh, about an inch and a half to two inch lip on either side, and if it's a a, a a panel piece that's put in, or no, if it's a one piece, no. But if the vehicle does roll over the trailer, uh, all bets are off on what can move. Everything can move because it's a unibody design. It's only designed to be upright and be as light as possible. Thank you. And then the second question is, do you use air chisels to help enlarge the holes to get hooves back through the air holes when they do come through? Yes, it would be whatever tool is easiest for them to use, uh, that is what would be used. Wonderful. Victor, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation.